Drakengard is an incredibly split game. On one hand, its legacy is monumental. It kickstarted a revolutionary series, would officially start Yoko Taro's career as a game director, and would eventually spawn the Nier games. The game also tells a wonderful tale, breaking boundaries and branching out by doing new things for the Japanese fantasy games of that time. On the other hand, Drakengard is somewhat of a tedious entry in the series. Its gameplay is incredibly bland and slow. The game design is satisfying at some parts, but mostly tedious. Half of the game is fun and enthralling, while the other is slow and monotonous. But the art, design, and turn that the story takes make it a game that you cannot miss. Its story twists and runs around, taking you along for the ride but never really telling you where you're going. It's ambitious, interesting, and mostly incredibly depressing. It would just be the start for the series and the beginning of something great, but it isn't perfect on its own. So today, I'd like to examine this game. We'll be taking a look at Drakengard, talking about story, gameplay, mechanics, and everything in between. If you enjoy the video and would like to support me, consider liking the video and subscribing as it really helps me out so I can continue making videos like this. You can also support me on Patreon where I give out early access to my videos, scattered text post updates, and longer versions of my full retrospectives. You can also follow me on Twitch where I play games that I'm not currently reviewing. Spoilers for Drakengard. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Drakengard. Drakengard actually had quite an interesting origin. It was developed by Kavia and published by Square Enix. The idea for the game began when Takamasa Shiba and Takuya Iwasaki were having a conversation at a bar. Shiba was working with Square Enix at the time, and Iwasaki had done some work on Final Fantasy IX and Kingdom Hearts at this point. The two had the idea to make a game that was like Ace Combat but with dragons. Yoko Taro eventually joined the project as an art director, but his designs weren't on par with what the team wanted. Since Iwasaki and Shiba didn't have confidence in their creative writing abilities, they made Taro the director of the project, and he wrote its script along with Sawako Natori. The team wanted to make a story that had a much darker tone than fantasy series at the time. They wanted to juxtapose themselves with the lighthearted and upbeat styles of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. Throughout development, the gameplay for Drakengard was shifted quite a lot. The team decided to add in ground-based combat, in addition to the aerial combat that the game started out including. This created numerous issues for the team. On top of that, Enix and Square were going through their merger at the time of development, so Taro was getting tons of suggestions for design changes from the board. The world of Drakengard was made particularly dark and bleak. Most of the characters in the games are morally gray. Drakengard's story was influenced by Celtic folklore and Neon Genesis Evangelion, so if you like those two things, you're in for a good time. At the time of development, Taro didn't think the game would be getting a sequel. The game included five endings, all of which were very bleak and dark. Taro was so worried about the game's tone and dark nature that Yosuke Saito went to pitch the game to Sony. They were so tired of reviewing pitches that day that they just approved the project without ever looking at it. Drakengard would eventually be announced in December of 2002. It was released in Japan as Drag on Dragoon on September 11th, 2003, and then was renamed for Western audiences because Drag on Dragoon didn't sound cool enough in English. Drakengard was released in North America for the PlayStation 2 on March 2nd, 2004. A few notes before we get into things. Drakengard was originally released for the PlayStation 2. I emulated the game for this review. I played it on the PCS X2 emulator. I did have some graphical issues in the beginning of my footage that I wasn't sure if they were a part of the game or not. For the most part though, the game ran fine with minimal issues or bugs. The second note is on the structure of this review. Like I said before, Drakengard has multiple endings, five in total. This would become a staple of Yoko Taro games moving forward. 
Because of this, I will first talk about the game, its story, its gameplay and mechanics, up until the first ending of the game. I will then go back to talk about all of the other endings, analyzing each one at the end. The game begins in an older time, when dragons still flew. The Union and the Empire are currently warring over a goddess. The Empire has gained great power recently, and they have begun to attack the castle where the goddess is held. We then see Firiai, the goddess that all this killing is over. She's inside the castle, overlooking a book as its pages begin to flip. We see a battle raging outside. Firiai's brother, Kayim, is fighting out on the field. Kayim is the heir to a small state that is part of the Union. During the battle, Kayim is wounded. He sees the Empire's troops begin to take the castle and makes his way back to the main building. Kayim and Firiai are orphans. Their parents were murdered by the Empire, specifically by a black dragon. We officially get to control Kayim and start slaughtering our enemies on the battlefield as we head towards the castle. He defeats the commanders on the front lines, barely making it inside the castle gates, still bleeding from his side. When he does make it inside, he finds that the Empire has captured and wounded a dragon. This reminds Kayim of his parents' death. Because of what he experienced, he has a great hatred for all dragons. As he's about to kill the dragon, he decides to make a pact with the beast. Kill me if you desire, but you can never dirty my soul, wretched human. Tell me, do you still want to live, dragon? What? A pact! There's no other way! <gasps> Wanting to make you worthy of a pact with me. Worthy or not, I wish to live. Despise me if you will, but I shall not die. In the world of Drakengard, called Midgard, humans can make pacts with all manner of creatures. These pacts usually provide the humans some sort of abilities, powers, or help from the creatures. The pact requires that the humans lose something, though. Neither truly wanting to make a pact with each other, Kayim hating dragons and the dragon hating humans, but as the dragon says, they are united by their need to live. The dragon breaks from its chains, and they are both healed as Kayim rises into the air. But Kayim had to give up something, his voice. He can no longer speak. We begin our first aerial mission. Before we talk more about the story, we should probably talk about the combat in Drakengard. There are two types of fighting sequences in the game, ground combat and aerial combat. Ground combat is easily the worst of the two. As I said before, this was mostly added to garner some more attention based on the massive success that was Dynasty Warriors. A lot of games were trying to be Dynasty Warriors clones at the time and grab some of their attention. So at its best, Drakengard's ground combat is a poor man's Dynasty Warriors. The combat is especially tired in the beginning of the game. We have a limited set of things that we can do in combat. Pressing square will attack, but at the beginning we can only really do a three hit combo. This will go up depending on the level of our weapon. Pressing triangle during certain points in one of these combos will do a special move that's different based on whichever of the 64 weapons that you're using. Attacking will also fill up our magic meter at the bottom of the screen. Magic is different based on the weapon we're using as well. This can be as simple as shooting fireballs out in front of us, or summoning a magic barrier that will burn down anything touching Kayim. As we level up weapons, the powers also get stronger, transform, and we get more magic meter when using said weapon. There's a large amount of variety here, and it's one thing I'll commend the game for. It seems that every weapon is distinct, and it depends on what sort of playstyle you want to go for. We start out only with Kayim's sword. This is a basic sword that gives us the ability to shoot out a fireball, damaging enemies it touches and in the area it lands. Ground combat also changes as we get the ability to use the dragon. We can hop on the dragon during ground combat and fly around, torching our enemies from above. The dragon can also use magic, which results in a hail of fire raining down on the enemies around us. This generally works alright, though the controls can be a bit awkward. Also, later in the game, enemies can get really tanky, so a lot of the time we just end up circling back to targets to wear down their health over time. 
We can also get knocked off the dragon by ranged enemies or archers on the ground. This creates situations where we really just can't use the dragon at all and are forced to go on foot. We can try and dodge around the volleys of arrows, but it just doesn't really work. Most ground missions are structured so that we have specific targets that we have to seek out. We kill these targets and then either other targets spawn that we have to kill, or we head to an area to end the mission. Usually it's the former, and the game likes to drag out missions spawning new targets over and over again. Enemies in Drakengard are generally pretty simple. Some of them will attack faster or slower, have more health or less, and there are even some spellcasters. The biggest variety in enemy design, though, is the anti-magic enemies. These enemies have a small red indicator letting us know that we can't use magic on them. Well, we can, but if we do, they counterattack, damaging us. This is fine and is probably a good way to introduce challenge and force the player to use different methods of approach. The only problem is we can't use the dragon on these enemies, otherwise we'll be knocked off by the counterattack. On top of that, the magic button and the combo button are the same, triangle. So when we're fighting non-magic enemies and we try to initiate a combo ability, sometimes we time it wrong and activate our magic, attacking the anti-magic enemies and taking damage from their counterattacks. If you want to play it safe, this leaves us only one way to go, which is spamming square over and over again. There really just isn't enough variety in combat in general, and it becomes very tedious over time. The ground missions just stretch themselves out so long, and there are so many of them. We're just slicing down hordes of enemies doing the same thing over and over again. It really becomes so tiresome and just not worth it. That's the biggest problem that this game has, is just tedium. I should also note that we cannot control the camera when we're on the ground. This creates so many awkward situations where we're trying to run at the camera and hope that the enemies don't attack before it flips itself around to show us our battlefield. It's even worse in situations where we're fighting against ranged foes. There was a point early on where I started to believe that I was enjoying the ground combat. I quickly realized that I was being tricked. I wasn't enjoying the combat because it was good, it was because there was a momentary satisfaction. Slicing down big groups of enemies was pleasing to my brain and seeing the numbers go up was great, but there was nothing else there. We can dodge and block with Kayim, but the dodge is the worst thing ever. It's mapped to the right and left bumpers. We can only dodge right or left, and don't ask how the game decides which way it's going to dodge outside of that. I think it's based on the camera placement, but every time I would try and dodge, it would throw me in some wild direction. It also just wasn't really ever useful because Drakengard isn't really hard. There was one boss fight towards the end of the game where I absolutely needed to dodge, but outside of that, just slicing up enemies and using magic was really the only necessary thing in the game. The other type of combat encounter in Drakengard is the aerial combat. Aerial combat is much better than ground, and you can tell that the game was originally designed to include just this. The ground combat was definitely an afterthought. In the sky, we can control our dragon. We can fire at enemies manually or lock onto them. We can also charge up our magic meter here and use it to send a massive volley of projectiles at enemies. The types of enemies that we'll fight are pretty varied. I will say the flight missions are where the art direction really comes into play. We get to see wide vistas, powerful enemies, and really great sights. The style and aesthetic of the game is really unique and genuinely good. The aerial missions do have an enemy variety problem of their own. They surely aren't as bad as the ground missions, but it is an issue. There are tons of different types of enemies, but a lot of them result in the same thing. There are too many enemies that will block our attacks until they attack us. It got to a point in the game where a new enemy was introduced, and I just automatically assumed I had to wait for them to attack so that I could damage them. And most of the time, I was right. That being said, the aerial missions are quite fun for the most part. Generally, they don't overstay their welcome. We just have to take out the targets on the screen and usually kill everything in front of us. They aren't as watered down as the ground missions. There are some that are a little too long, but never to the extent that Kayim's solo sections were. In general, combat feels like two wildly different games. One feels half-baked with some alright ideas, but really poor execution. The other feels like a genuine attempt at making something fun while also introducing new style and design to the formula. 
Overall, it's all right. And there were genuine good moments and really bad moments. There's a lot of good here, but just as much bad. Kaya mounts the dragon and takes it into the sky. They begin to take out the Empire forces swarming the castle. While in the sky, we will often hear interjections from our dragon or from other characters in the game. This creates a constant flow of narrative information, developing characters and plot lines as we're fighting waves of foes. We learn pretty quickly that the dragon that Kaya made a pact with detests humans. She thinks they are a foul race that is far below dragons and doesn't understand them at all. The dragon remarks that with Kayam's voice gone, she will speak for both of them. This sets the tone for the game, the story, and the turn that Kayam will make throughout the tale. The distaste, disgust, and apathy that the dragon spits out is representative in a change in Kayam as well. Kayam heads into the castle to save his sister. Firiai is incredibly important, not only because she is the goddess, but because she is a seal. There are four seals in Midgard that protect it from falling into madness. Firiai is one of these, with the other three being the desert seal, ocean seal, and the forest seal. We head through the castle, cutting down any soldiers in our way. When we arrive at Firiai, we see that Inuart is already there. Inuart is Kayam's friend, and he's staving off soldiers that have already made it to her room. When Kayam makes it to them, he begins repeatedly stabbing a soldier. We learn that Kayam has a massive bloodlust and anger and rage inside of him. Firiai and Inuart realize that Kayam can't speak. Inuart suggests that they take Firiai to the elf village. The elves are bound to neutrality, unable to take a side. Before Firiai was the goddess, she was betrothed to Inuart, so he will do anything to keep her safe. Inuart is a harp player, and before they head off, he decides to sing a song for the two. The usual song? When we arrive at the elf village, we find that it's already been attacked. The neutral place and safe haven that the group has sought out isn't what they needed to find. Inuart decides to look at the village for himself. He doesn't trust the dragon pack beast. We have to defend the skies from the imperial forces inhabiting it and the forests themselves. We eventually arrive at the village to find it completely destroyed. Inuart has completely lost hope at this point. The dragon then begins to hear the voice of the hierarch Verdele. He is essentially a priest who acts as a guardian of the Four Seals. He also has a pact beast in that of a petrified dragon. Since he has a pact, he can therefore hear and communicate with other pact holders. He's currently at the temple in the desert. Inuart feels a failure for not being able to protect Firiai as easily as he thought he could. The group decides to head to the desert temple to find Verdele. Before we leave, Kayam finds a message written in blood. Speak not the watchers, draw not the watchers, write not the watchers, sculpt not the watchers, sing not the watchers, call not the watchers' name. What is this? The watchers are some type of otherworldly beings that will arrive if the seals are broken. We find a woman dying nearby who tells us that the cult of the watchers attacked the village and took everything to a place in the valley. We track down the cult and defeat them in the valley, battling a massive wave of priests. When we finally slay the final priest, we realize the elves were taken somewhere else. At this point, the dragon loses Verdele's voice. She can no longer hear him. A man crawls up and tells us that the Empire has taken his village in the Fairy Valley. The dragon asks Kayam an important question. Do you go to save lives, or to take them? Kayam has built up a massive hatred for the Empire. He wants them dead, and nothing the dragon can say will stop him. We take out the Imperial forces about the village, but when we arrive, we see a man with a knife pointed to his neck. This man is Leonard. He lives in the forest with his three younger brothers. Leonard has a bit of a fucked up story, which is really the only way to put it. 
I'm literally just not even going to talk about it. He's probably the most controversial character in the series. And if I went into detail here, YouTube would just nuke my channel immediately. If you're interested, just go look it up. Regardless, Leonard was gone while his brothers were murdered. He feels personally responsible and decides to take his own life, but he doesn't. A fairy comes along and begins jeering at him and making fun of him. He makes a pact with the fairy and loses his sight in the process. Since Leonard has a pact now, we begin to hear his voice. We find him among the forest and he tells us that he knows that the goddess is in danger. He decides to join our party and come with us, but he still cannot forgive himself for the things that he's done. We gain Leonard as an ally here. Allies are characters that we can equip and use on ground missions. Three times per mission, we can press circle to summon an ally for a short period of time. They have their own weapons, abilities, and skill sets. We finally head to the desert to seek out Inuart and Furiae, as well as find Verdele. Furiae tells us that Inuart and Verdele were taken in the process of protecting her. We eventually find the dungeon that Verdele is being held at, but Inuart was taken elsewhere. We rescue him, and he tells us that the Empire is trying to reconstruct the world. When the seals are broken, the seeds of resurrection will appear. The Empire wants these seeds to restart the world itself. As each seal breaks, Furiae grows weaker and her burden is heavier. We see Inuart in his prison. He begs for strength, but a voice of the Cult of the Watchers begins to speak to his inner desires. This is where the aesthetic choices and design really begin to shine in Drakengard. My betrothed, she shall love only me. Please stop. All mine, Furiae, all mine, all mine, all mine. No man can have her, no man. Not even Kaim. The game will shift greatly over the course of our adventure. Towards the end of the game is when things really start to get interesting, not only in the story, but also in the environments, characters, world, and lore. The piece really is crafted masterfully, and nothing is accidental here. The voice speaking to Inuart tells him that the burden will kill Furiae. Inuart sees a way to help Furiae, but the only way he could get the strength to do so is to make a pact with a dragon. Inuart then opens his eyes to reveal they've changed to red, signifying that he's been taken over by some dark presence. We have to go protect the Desert Seal, as the Empire has already begun to target it. We defeat much of the Imperial armies, but wraiths begin to attack us. These are supposed to only target us if we move quickly, but they're really pretty weak, so we can just take them down. We take out the Imperial commanders and try to hold back the Empire's forces from the seal. Verdele is shocked by the sacrilege that he witnesses, but their efforts are futile. The desert seal is destroyed. While they guarded the sacred symbols, they found Inuart's harp in the sand. Kaim and Verdele return to Furiae to tell her what happened. The group has begun to hear a strange voice, and it seems their only lead at this point. The voice is coming from an imperial jail. We then see the prison, two guards talk about a mad woman that's being kept there. She's laughing, and the only thing we learn about her is that her whole family died. Just then, the Union begins to attack. This woman's name is Ariosh. She is an elf woman whose family was slaughtered, leaving her mad. She then began killing masses of children to try and save them. She was then jailed for her crimes and created a pact with two elementals, Udin and Salamander. Ariosh, like Leonard, is another ally to us. At this point, our dragon levels up, giving us more power and more lock-on targets in battle, as well as another magic bar. We then see another dragon arrive, and Inuart shows up. He's made a pact with a black dragon. He tells Firiae to come with him. He tells Kaim that he traded his songs for strength. He can no longer play music. The thing that made Inuart himself is gone. Kaim doesn't let him take her. This is a massive betrayal to him. His greatest ally and friend has now sided with the same beast that killed his parents. The two dragons begin to battle and the red dragon is losing. Kaim rushes to save her but is blasted with flame. His dragon steps in front of the fireball. Inuart attacks Verdele and takes Furiae. The harp has been cast down. Inuart is gone and something else has taken his place. Kaim is frustrated. He feels betrayed, alone, and defeated. Verdele says that anger filled him when Inuart attacked. He feels that he has lost his soul in this, his priesthood. The group heads towards the castle to try and rescue Furiae from Inuart. 
On the way, we meet Sire, a young child that's made a pact with a golem. This is our final ally of the game. Sire is a twin, with his sister being Mana. He was attacked and his mother was killed by the Empire. This led him to making the pact with Gollum. Now, each character has their own little side path that we'll talk about during the endings section of the story. These are extra chapters that build up the characters further and let us into their backstory, as well as provide vital plot information. Sire does join us to try and find his sister Mana, who was abandoned by their mother after being neglected. As the group battles the Empire forces, they hear the death rattle of the fairies. This means that the third seal has been broken. The only seal left is the goddess. Kayum now has to head to the Empire's lands to find the fortress that Firiai is being held at. When we arrive, the Empire and the Union have amassed all of their forces for one final battle. The Empire has revealed a new creation, though, the Cyclops, massive war monsters created in their factories. I love the design on the Cyclops. It's the first introduction of something truly massive and warped in the game. It's not a natural beast, but it is a representation of how far the Empire has gone. Even the Red Dragon questions whether this could have been made by man. We defeat a few of these and Kayim begins to assist in the final battle. As we take out all of the important soldiers, the day is won. The Union is victorious. Just then, the sky is darkened and magical bombs are let loose by the Empire, destroying the rest of the Union soldiers. The environment around us has been turned into a wasteland. Verdule thinks that Furiae must have been killed. The last seal must have been broken. We have to head to the Empire's flying fortress in the sky. Before we do that, the Empire's soldiers begin to rise from the dead. As we head towards the fortress, we begin to fight pure manifestations of evil, warped and twisted creatures coming from all sides. We then see Furiae being held in the fortress. She is with the voice that we heard before, controlling Inuart, and Inuart himself. We then have to fight Inuart, our first large boss fight of the game. Here, Inuart is on his black dragon, and he's actually pretty hard to hit. Most attacks he will either dodge or counter. His attacks aren't very hard to avoid, though, but we have to shoot at him when he's vulnerable. When he's already doing an attack is normally when he'll get hit. He flees the battle before we can defeat him. We head to the fortress and have to make our way inside. Once we do, we have 20 minutes to find Furiae. When we make it in, we find the High Priestess of the Watchers. This is Mana, Sire's younger twin sister. In addition to that, Furiae has already been killed. The final seal has been broken. As Inuart sees her, the influence on him is broken. Inuart begins to despair and decide whether this was all his fault or not. As he cries out, Mana dances around the tragic scene. <laughs> What have you done? I broke, I broke the, the seal. seal. Now, now she's, she's useless. Watchers left. Watchers left. Inuart takes Furiae into the sky, her lifeless body on top of his dragon. He gave up everything to save her, and he still couldn't do it. But Inuart hopes for a miracle. He needs to bring her back to life. The seeds of resurrection are now here, now that all the seals have been broken. Inuart is trying to find one of these seeds, but only evil can come from them. We battle Inuart again and stop him from doing this. We head to the Imperial City, which has now been bathed in red. Hell has arrived in Midgard. We have to fight the Worm, which is a member of an ancient race of dragons. These are vilified as myths, and the Red Dragon quakes at the mere sight of one. They are not meant to be attacked. We have to battle the Worm. We attack it and its minions until it balls up and we can't do damage. We repeat the process until he's dead. With this, the dragon thanks Kaim, and she begins to feel a kinship towards him, never having felt anything for humans before. We battle more hellish beasts above and inside the city itself. Once we get to the temple, Mana awaits. These last missions are particularly rough, especially the temple mission. We have to fight so many enemies here. They just keep coming over and over, and most of them are repeats. It's just jacked up the level of foes to inflate the challenge of the mission, but it really just makes it tedious. Kayim is going to kill Mana to get his revenge, but Verdule stops him. He tells him that killing a child is too great an evil for his soul to bear. 
He steps forward to seal the evil within Mana. Verdele casts the seal, but it doesn't work. It only makes Mana grow even stronger. At this point, if you can't see the Evangelion influence, I don't even know what to tell you. We have to defeat Mana, only attacking her when she is vulnerable. After this, Mana still is being controlled slightly by the Watchers, but she's lucid enough to beg for death. Kayim refuses this, though. The group has to decide who the next seal will be so that the world can be safe from the Watchers once more. The Red Dragon offers to be the next seal. This clearly shows the dragon's change over the course of the story. She started out hating humans and everything they represent, but her pact with Kayim has changed her, and she now offers her life to protect humanity. The seal is a painful process, and Kayim sheds tears as his companion writhes on the ground. The dragon decides at the end of her life she will finally tell Kayim her name. I have never seen you weep before. There is but one thing I wish for you to remember. Angelus. My name is Angelus. You are the first and the last of your kind to know my name. Angelus fades away into the sky as the seal is created. This is the first ending to the game, the anguish of an unsmiling watcher, or ending A. This is what's considered to be the main story of the game, or at least your first route through the story. I really enjoy this one, and it does a lot to develop characters, but there are still four more endings we need to talk about. The second ending that we can achieve is ending B. In Drakengard, the story is laid out in chapters and verses. Verses are generally either missions, events, or just cutscenes that we experience as we play through the tale. Some of these verses will require us to come back to them later, hiding parts of the story until we've finished others. Some of these will also be locked based on how fast we completed certain missions. The route for ending B sees Inuart taking Firiai's body to the Seeds of Destruction. He successfully places her body inside and she is resurrected, but not as he thought. The Seeds seem to use the individual to create a massive power that is hell-bent on taking down humanity. Furiai's boss battle is a little difficult, but nothing we can't handle. We have to attack her and avoid her volley of powerful blows. As Kayim holds Furiai in his arms, dozens of copies of the monster that Furiai became have been created by the Seeds, signaling a battle that Kayim and Angelus probably cannot win. This is Flowers for the Broken Spirit, or Ending B. Ending C sees Kayim arriving before Firiai is actually killed. She reveals her true feelings about being the goddess, but due to some translation issues with the English version, the full meaning isn't explained. In the Japanese version, her true motives are fully revealed, that she has feelings for Kayim, her own brother. She then impales herself with the dagger, either out of shame or because of the burden of her duty. Again, Inuart tries to take her body to the Seeds of Resurrection, but fails in bringing back Firiai. He dies beside her, at least finding some sort of peace in death. Mana is then standing at the altar, attempting to summon a dragon, but is killed. It's then that Angelus takes on her chaos form. She has decided to disband the pact between her and Kayim, altering their deal. We learn that dragons were created by the gods to guard the world and destroy humanity. The dragons have now begun to revolt against the Watchers, though, and Angelus can no longer be used by a human. She turns against us and we have to fight her. Now, this was easily the fight that I thought was the hardest in the game. It was somehow my favorite and my least favorite battle rolled together in one. The fight is interesting because we actually have to pay attention to mechanics, dodge, and pick our strikes when we can. Angelus will throw fireballs at us, lunge at us, and rain magic down from the sky. We have to dodge all of this and use the moments when she isn't attacking to get in hits. We also can't use magic against her, which makes this more difficult. 
The last couple phases are the worst ones though, where balls of energy chase us on the ground in random patterns, and we can never tell when they're going to hit. But I do really love the symbolism of the battle, Angelus finally fulfilling the corruption that she spoke of so much and going against humanity in full. Also, since the pact is broken, we finally hear Kaim speak again, regaining himself once more before the end. I am Kaim. Eventually, we take down Angelus and he destroys the Seed of Resurrection. But outside, the dragons begin their uprising, ready to take down humanity for good. Kaim rushes towards the light, ready to defend the world, to use his sword to save, not to kill. Even though this ending is just as tragic as the rest, if not more so, I think it's probably one of my favorites. It just really makes sense for the whole story and wraps it up very well. This is a companion's eternal farewell, or ending C. Ending D sees us starting from the same section. We are journeying through the fortress attempting to find Firiai, but if we go a different way and find Mana, Siade confronts her. As Mana is killed by Gollum, the Watchers begin to descend from the skies. They float down and kill Ariosh, as well as Leonard, as he sacrifices himself trying to destroy them. The Queen Beast arrives, or the Queen of the Watchers. We have to defeat the Queen, and Verdele comes up with a plan to save everyone. Since Sire gave up his time as a part of his pact, stopping his aging, he believes he can break his pact and freeze the Queen in time. On the way to get Sire to the Queen, Kaim and Angelus are killed, but Sire arrives, breaking his pact and trapping the world around him in time, saving Midgard. This is the wild dreams of a deluded child, ending D. The final end, ending E, is easily the most difficult one to get. I really shouldn't say difficult, but just time-consuming. Like I said before, there are 64 weapons in the game and we have to find every single one to be able to get this ending. This requires a lot of work, a lot of venturing to hidden areas, waiting for chests to spawn, completing missions under a certain time, it's a lot. But eventually this unlocks a final chapter. This takes place directly before Sire is sent to trap the queen. Instead of trapping the queen, the group attacks her and a portal is opened. They all fall inside, only to be transported to modern day Tokyo. We have an incredibly strange boss battle where we have to match the colors of rings that emanate from the queen. Square is white and triangle is black. This is incredibly difficult because if we get one wrong, we lose and have to start over, and it really goes on for quite a while. This ending was actually an homage to the end of Evangelion and was originally meant to be a joke ending. The ending was originally conceived as a singing competition against a giant version of the pop singer Ayumi Hamasaki. After the queen is killed, her body begins dissolving, introducing an unknown substance to the world. Kaim and Angelus are immediately shot out of the air and killed by Japanese fighter jets. Angelus's body is impaled on Tokyo Tower. There's a lot more to this ending that would actually create the spin-off series for Drakengard called Nier, but we'll talk about that later. The story overall for Drakengard is fantastic, and if you know me, then you know I'm a huge fan of multiple endings. It lets the players decide which one is best, which one they like the most. It also just introduces variety into the story. What would have happened if... The endings in Drakengard are also particularly tragic. Each story ends in a way that either wrecks the world or someone dies. Angelus is sacrificed as the seal, Firiai is transformed and the world is doomed, Angelus betrays Kaim and humanity, Kaim and Angelus have to sacrifice themselves to save the world, as does Sire, and the group is transported to Tokyo, fighting a fierce battle with the queen, only to be killed directly after. 
Drakengard is an incredibly ambitious project. It attempts to tell a new story in a unique world. The aesthetic and design of Midgard feels incredibly fresh even today. Seeing the grotesqueries crawl from their portals is an eye-opening sight. A scene like this makes us realize that the people making this cared about what people were playing. They wanted to tell a story that was new, that was fresh. The characters are given ample time and story to develop their personalities. Each one feels like a fleshed out being, a person with faults, flaws, and room to grow. Speaking of flaws, every character in Drakengard is incredibly flawed. They're all morally gray. No one here is good. Angelus hates humans and thinks they should be extinguished. Verdelay doubts his faith and constantly punishes himself for it, pushing his life into non-confrontation. Furiae is into her brother. Inuart is obsessed with Furiae to the point that he becomes corrupted and leaves his soul behind. Leonard is... yeah. Ariosh has gone mad and slaughtered children. Sire is, well, Sire is really not flawed, but you get the point. And most of all is Kayam. Kayam, our main character, is filled with a bloodlust in revenge. He wants to kill everything that stands in his way, no matter what the cost. The game doesn't try to hold this fact from us. We, as the player, are constantly told by the game to kill. That's our whole mission every single time. We have targets we must seek out and defeat them. There's no way around this at all. But the characters in the game are constantly shouting at us, telling us that we slaughter needlessly, that it's too much. But there's nothing we can do. We play Kayim and he has lost his speech. We can't rationalize this. We can't break through and speak to these characters to tell them why we do this. We just have to do it. In one of the characters' individual paths, we have to rescue one of our companions in the forest. The Empire has employed young conscripts, just kids forced into military work. His group tells him not to kill these kids, but he does, because they're in his way, because he has to, to save his sister, to save the world. Do you go to save lives, or take them? With that all being said, Drakengard is not a great game. It's an amazing, fantastic story, fresh with things that feel genuinely new to me, but the gameplay portion is just not good. The game is unbalanced with poor design. The ground combat can be incredibly slow and just grating at times. It's clear that this was not what the original game was supposed to be. It was supposed to be something wildly different. Fighting through crowds of enemies feels okay at first, but after the 200th time we've done it, it starts to get a little old. The game's combat only finds its full flight towards the end when things become difficult and more scenically interesting. The air combat is better but with its own problems as well. The controls can be incredibly awkward at points, and most levels can be a little too easy to provide anything new for us to deal with. Once we get the hang of it though, it is fun, but it's still flawed in its own way. Regardless of its faults, most of Drakengard tries to do something new, and that's always something that I'll commend. Trying to break the status quo and introduce new ideas is fantastic, and something we need way more of today. Drakengard didn't do very well sales-wise. It was no blockbuster, but by the end of 2003, it had sold 240,000 copies. The reviews weren't great either, sitting at a 63 on Metacritic. Most praised the story, calling it the game's biggest strength, but the gameplay was torn apart, with critics citing the bland environments and repeated enemy designs. Even though Drakengard wasn't a huge success, Square Enix decided to greenlight a sequel, though the next game in the series would not be directed by Yoko Taro. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.